Today we are continuing our series where Timothy left off in uh, through, the, through the book of Exodus. And um, if you haven't told already, uh, I do things a little bit differently. Our verse today is in Exodus 2, verses 1 through 10, but instead of going through that, uh, we're going to go s- see the context of this verse, and then at the last minute when you're about to sleep or doze off, we're going to all stand up and read together God's Word. So be ready for that. It's going to come unexpectedly. Um, and it's not just through any context that we're going to see through this verse, which tells us the origins of the prophet Moses, but we are going to see him specifically through the lens of God's promise to Abraham. And the reason why this is important is that it shows a great lesson for each and every one of us, that God works through unexpected ways and fulfills his promises in ways that we can never fully understand, especially during a context where we're struggling or we don't understand why God is doing this or we have doubts or we're wavering. We're going to see today that God is going to be working just like he did through Abraham and through Moses, his providence through his promises, even though it might not work in a way that we fully understand or comprehend at the time. We're first going to look where Abraham receives a promise from God in Genesis chapter 12. And to give you some context, Abraham, if you remember, is just a migrant. His father, Terah, actually went from out uh, east in Mesopotamia, uh, near where modern-day Iraq is, and he's going to go eastward, uh, or sorry, westward, towards um, Israel and Palestine. And so him and his father are traveling, uh, as well with his nephew, Lot, and they get uh, about, you know, a little bit to a quarter of the way there, in a place called Haran, which would be northern Syria, And Terah decides to rest and settle, and eventually he dies. After Terah passes away, Abram's father, God appears to him and makes this extravagant promise to him. It says in Genesis 12, verse 2, And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. So God, for seemingly no reason, is coming to this migrant and telling him, hey, keep going, keep going to Canaan, because I'm going to make you a great nation. Uh, We see him reiterate this in Genesis 15 and 17, saying that he's going to be, his uh, offspring are going to be as plentiful as the stars. So you see just these very extravagant metaphors for what Abram has in store for him. And as we're reading this, we're really not sure, okay, when is this promise going to be fulfilled? How is this going to be unfolding? And of course, we're reminded that God is working in unexpected ways. There's a really strange verse in chapter 15 where Abram has a vision. But before I explain this verse, I want you to know what exactly it means to have a promise in the Hebrew. If you remember from our uh, sermon in Ruth, we talked about the word redeemer, how that word in the Hebrew has a much more precise meaning. And the same could be said with the word for promise in the Hebrew. The word for um, a promise or close to a promise in our English, in the word in the Hebrew, would be the word berit, berit. So that word It actually means a covenant, literally a covenant, uh, or pretty much like a royal decree or a royal contract, you can think of it. And so often what you would have during the Bronze Age, where the story of Abraham takes place, is you would have a suzerain and a vassal, or you can think of it as a king and a subject. And the subject would submit to the king and usually give them devotion, their love, uh, offer up anything they can fully to this king, And the king, in response, would give them protection or honor that servant or that subject. And obviously, if the subject rebels or disobeys the king, then that would be subject to a curse or punishment for the rebellion. And if you couldn't tell, this is exactly what we see illustrated throughout the Hebrew Bible, where we see... God and Israel going back and forth following this royal decree or this covenant. 
And so as we get to verse 15, there's a really, really odd image, an odd verse that we see. So to, to explain to you, so Abram is asleep, right? He's in a dream and he is having this vision. And in this vision, he sees God and God telling him, hey, come and bring me these three different animals and to sacrifice them, but not just sacrifice them, but to actually go and split them completely in half. And Abraham's like, okay, you know, he goes and gathers the animals, splits them in half. And then God suddenly appears to him and is in this image of a oven, like literally like one of those clay uh, fireplaces where you would have kind of this, um, almost like a cauldron made of clay. And you see this image of this cauldron and also an image of a flaming torch. And this is representing God. And you see these two objects levitate and over, like pass over uh, these bodies right in between the two halves of these animals. And you're probably thinking, well, what does that mean? What, what, does, this, what does this cryptic passage really entail? Well, it's explained by what happened during this time period. There was a common ritual that would happen uh, preceding this royal covenant or this barit, where you would have the subject come to the king and he would go and split an animal in two before the king and he himself would pass through that animal in between the two halves. And what that showed and symbolized is that whatever would happen to the subject may he receive the same fate as this calf or this ox split in half if they go back on their word, if they go back on their promise. But notice with that context, when we see verse 15, or chapter 15 and verse 17, we see that it's not Abraham who you would expect to go through these animals, but it's God himself going through and putting himself on the line, showing that he is making the promise on his own behalf. He is the one putting himself on the line to show that he's serious about this promise. And that gives us just such a powerful illustration of God saying, not only is my word my bond, but I am going through as a subject going through a king. I am showing you how much this contract means to me. So this is where we get our understanding of a promise that Abraham has. And as the audience continues throughout the book of Genesis, we have a story of Abraham's descendants. And as we go, we're kind of waiting to see who's going to be this great nation builder, this great nation leader who's going to explode the Hebrew people, the ancestors of Abram. First, we see Isaac. At first, well, at first we're, we're puzzled because, for one thing, Abram doesn't even have a son. Sarah is infertile. And yet God, through his providence, provides late in Abraham's and Sarah's life a child named Isaac. And Isaac grows up. He becomes a very smooth negotiator. He gets land. Uh, he's a talented farmer. So he takes care of this land, and he becomes wealthy. And over time, we can see that as he grows in might, it doesn't really qualify as a great nation, though. So we're still, okay, so he's not going to be our great leader we're expecting. And then we come to Jacob, his son. And Jacob grows up, and he similarly, you know, does well for himself. He's a very skilled animal breeder and shepherd. But still, his, you know, his offspring, his 12 children, aren't what God promised. You know, there's no explosion. They're not getting as numerous as stars. So where... We're just waiting to see who is going to explode and become this great nation. One of the motifs that we see through this is that there is a, a theme or a motif of the successor, meaning that one child or descendant is chosen to carry on the next promise or the, the promise that God provided Abraham. And we see that as kind of a passing of the torch of who's gonna become our main character in the book of Genesis. First, it becomes Abraham, and Abraham chooses over his other siblings, um, uh, Isaac over Ishmael. And then likewise, Isaac will choose Jacob over Esau. And so we see this theme of giving the torch to a chosen child, usually the younger, weaker child. And it's a little bit different when we get to Joseph because Joseph will be where things get really exciting. We have this person who is sold into slavery, who is demeaned and humbled. 
and yet will go and grow to be this great governor. God gives him a gift of a vision, and he sees, he foresees a great famine that's going to basically put the world at its knees, and Egypt is going to be, have the foresight to know what's going on and store all their grains, all their things in advance, so they'll wear out the famine, and all other nations are going to be dependent on them to get their, their food. And so Joseph becomes what's called a satrap. He becomes like a governor, second in command to Pharaoh, and he oversees this big project of distributing um, food, not just for Egyptians, but all these other nations, including what we'll see, those in Canaan, his very own brothers, and his father. And so as you guys know the story, they reunite. Uh, and then afterwards, Pharaoh rewards Joseph for his stewardship. And they give them a land up in the Nile Delta where you'll have a land called Gosen, where it's going to be very prosperous. They're going to be able to settle and multiply and grow in might. And so now things are getting excited. We're finally seeing, OK, is, we're, we're getting somewhere now. Joseph has actually attained governorship. He's actually obtained real power. And they're growing exponentially. In Gosen, they are multiplying. They're becoming not just like a family tribe. They're becoming almost like a nation now. So as they are growing in this, we are waiting, OK, what's going to happen next? And in the case of Jacob, unlike um, Abram and Isaac before him, he doesn't bless Joseph or Benjamin or people we're expecting. He's, he actually blesses a grandson. So Joseph, while he's in Egypt, actually marries a wife from Pharaoh. And they have two children. And Jacob decides to pass his blessing on to one of these two children named Manasseh and Ephraim. And surprisingly, he chooses the younger son over the older son. So Manasseh is the older one, Ephraim is the younger one, and Ephraim is chosen in Genesis 48 to, to pass on, to be a successor. So as we open into Exodus, we are just waiting. Okay, now things are coming together. We're going to expect a new leader that's going to go beyond where Joseph was short and maybe become first in command. Maybe he will overcome Pharaoh and become a leader of this great nation God promised. And so, and perhaps the 12 tribes will be united under this figure named Ephraim. And as we open in Exodus, we know that, once again, God is not working in a way that we expect the story to go. In Exodus 1, we are, things seem to be going well. They seem to be growing and multiplying in their providence in Gosen. But then in Exodus 1.8, things take a dark turn which we'll see, instead of Pharaoh um, helping him and propping him up, Joseph dies, and a new Pharaoh takes the place of the old Pharaoh who supported Joseph and his family. And now this other Pharaoh doesn't know Joseph, meaning that he does not know him. They're not going to appreciate all Joseph and his family did to prop up Egypt and help him with the, the, you know, the largest crisis the world has seen up to that point. And so this Pharaoh, in fact, is feel threatened by Joseph and his family. And he wants to cut off the military threat that this new growing people group is becoming. And he decides this by plotting to kill all the newborn males in the Hebrew population. And he does this in three different ways. The first way, he decides to, instead of prop up this people group, he's going to capture them and enslave them and put them into um, a camp, basically work them to death, uh, building storehouses in Pharaoh, for Pharaoh. And so they move them from this land of prosperity and carry them to the capital of Egypt at that time, where they'll be enslaved. But Pharaoh's plan does not go as planned. Instead of shutting them down, or working them to death, they're actually growing and multiplying even more through their hardship and their toil. So Pharaoh hatches another plan. His second plan is to go and to assassinate all the newborn male babies as they're getting birth, and just to, to discreetly kind of get the maidservants to assassinate them. And so he hires uh, two maidservants to carry out this plot named Shifra and Pua, but thankfully, they see that this is not God's will. So they fear God and disobey Pharaoh by deceiving him and saying, uh, it's kind of funny, they say that how 
Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. You know, Egyptian woman, you'll need a midwife to give birth, but Hebrew women, they just, the baby just pops out and you can't do anything about it. Sorry, Pharaoh. Like they, you know, they go through labor before we can get to them. So with that excuse, Pharaoh's like, drats, you know, I can't, can't get them this time. So for the third and final plot that Pharaoh has, he decides, you know what, I'm going to go public. I'm just going to say, let's throw all the newborn baby males into the river, into the Nile. And so that's what he does. He goes and they have this campaign to toss out all the newborn males. And that brings us now to our verse and our introduction to a Levite family. So if you could stand with me. We're at the point. Everyone's still awake? We're ready. If you could stand for the word of God, uh, starting in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Uh, it reads, Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him any longer, she got him in a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile. When her maids walked, walking alongside the Nile, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you? Uh, from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse a child for you. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So, she, so the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, because I drew him out of water. You may be seated. Okay, so to summarize the story, we have this Levi family, and now we're kind of surprised because we're expecting Ephraim, or one of Joseph's um, sons or descendants, to come and be our next protagonist. But instead, we're introduced to a Levite, and if you remember from Genesis, Levite and his brother Simeon were essentially disgraced by their father Jacob because um, they took vengeance on their daughter Dinah and instead of being the bigger person, they decided to slaughter a whole tribe uh, called the Hevites. And so that made them odious and unwelcome to the land, and they were kicked out unceremoniously. So it's really strange that we're introduced to, out of all the tribes, Levi. But nevertheless, where this woman from the tribe conceives and bears a son and hides him for three months, and then after it was no longer tenable to protect them, they decide to form a plan to put him upstream, up the Nile River. And this was likely in hopes that another tribe or another people group living in Egypt where this decree wasn't in effect could adopt and then take care of this baby. And so uh, Miriam, um, the brother of Moses, or sorry, the sister of Moses, uh, who will, will later identify as Miriam, is now on a reconnaissance mission. She has a job to go and make sure her little brother is going to be taken care of. And so Moses is put on a basket, goes upstream, and lo and behold, you know, who else but Pharaoh's own daughter seizes him and takes pity on him and opens up the basket and finds a baby crying who we can imagine is malnourished, perhaps starving. And she decides, you know what, I'm going to adopt this baby and make it my own. And Miriam, being very clever, uh, kind of blends in with Pharaoh's daughter's entourage there and says, hey, you know, wouldn't it be a great idea if a Hebrew went and nursed this child for you so you can get on to important royal things? Pharaoh's daughter agrees, and she says, go find a, a Hebrew servant to, to come raise this child. And lo and behold, he doesn't know that Miriam and Moses are related, but then he goes and finds who else but her mother to be the nurse and gets hired to become uh, a, an official nurse to oversee the, the care of her son. And so as Moses and his mother grow up into adolescence, he's finally taken, once he gets to 
an age where he's dependent, and then he's officially adopted to the house of Pharaoh. And in that, he is then officially named Moses. And like other major biblical characters we'll see throughout the Old Testament, he's named after the circumstances surrounding his birth or his story. And so he is named out of being drawn from water and saved and delivered out of the water. And as we go on and see the life of Moses, we can see how God is using these crazy circumstances, not at all what the audience is expecting to perform his will. Instead of this great and mighty Ephraim figure, we, are, we have to settle with this central character who is a Levite, who is a murderer, who is a fugitive, with a speech impediment that needs his brother to do any sort of public speaking on his behalf. But nevertheless, God uses this figure that we're going to be introduced to in Exodus to go and deliver and save his people from the wrath of Pharaoh. And instead of overtaking Pharaoh or becoming a leader of Egypt, what happens? We are on a wild ride for the next four books of the Bible where Moses is taking his people, getting in conflicts with Pharaoh, rescuing his people, taking him to Mount Sinai, running around the desert, uh, fighting these different kings along the way, and all that to finally settle into their homeland in Canaan, which will one day be Israel. So Abraham's promise is fulfilled, but not in a straight line, not in an A to B way, but in a way that just doesn't make sense. There's a lot of zigzags to get to that promise. And isn't that so true for us as well, that we can have got faith in God's promises, we can have faith that God works in our lives, but so often it's not just a straight path, right? There's a lot of zigzags. There's a lot of misdirection. There's a lot of suffering and questions and doubting and not understanding why did God choose this path. We see this in other biblical stories. We see this with Job. Why is tragedy striking me? Um, and so we can wrestle with that. We can always ask why God, why, and never have an answer. But nevertheless, God will show us through these challenges, through this loss, and these trying circumstances, that he is indeed working in ways we can't fully understand. For our youth devotional, we wanted to honor the legacy of Martin Luther King uh, during his day this week. And he has a really famous quote that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And what that insinuates is similar to God. God's uh, path to righteousness and to redemption is long, is arduous, it crisses and crosses, but at the, it bends towards righteousness and God's justice, even if we can't see it uh, visibly in our lives quite yet. And I wanted to close by sharing a story uh, there is a woman named Authorine Lewis. I don't know if you've heard that name before, but similar to Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, she is an icon of the civil rights movement and a fervent Christian who thirsted for righteousness. She was a English teacher. She graduated from an all-black college at the time in, uh, in 1952. And later, she would go on uh, to be the first applicant, black applicant, to apply for the University of Alabama. So in 1952, at the age of 23, she applied along with another friend, and she was rejected uh, for having the sin of having a different colored skin tone than her peers. Not long afterward, in 1954, the Supreme Court famously ruled in Brown versus Board of Education that segregated public schooling was unconstitutional. So begrudgingly, she applied again to the university and begrudgingly the university had to enroll her by law. But there was a few caveats. She was banned from living on campus. She could not eat at the university diners. She could commute to her classes and then promptly leave. On her first day of class, it was Friday, February 3rd, 1956. 
To say that she was bullied on that day of school would be a sad understatement. There was a mob that harassed her and made it their responsibility to ensure she felt as miserable as humanly possible. She was insulted to her face. Students would come, push her, shove her, uh, yell at her face, epithets. They blocked her pathway to her first class. From a distance, they threw stones and taunted her, threw eggs and laughed as it splashed across her. She required a police escort to and between her classes that day. On the following Monday, on her second day of class, February 6, there was a pro-segregation protest that took place on the campus. Quickly, there was a riot that broke out on campus. Authorine's car was vandalized. Her life was threatened. Uh, she actually had to run away from her classroom and barricade herself into a dormitory. She was there barricaded for hours and hours and hours before the police could get the riot under control and that she could safely leave the premises. During that time when she was barricaded in that room, she prayed to God that her life could be saved and that the hearts of those who want to do her harm would be softened. As you might expect, the following day, the dean of the university did not punish a single one of her taunters or harassers or the rioters. Instead, Althreen was expelled from the university the justification being for her own safety, it was better for her to leave. It seems like she was not ever going to get that decree, that Pharaoh had won the day. God's justice was squashed that day, or so it seemed. But that's not how our story ends. 32 years later, in 1988, Ms. Althring Lucy would return again and apply to that very same program at the University of Alabama, and she got accepted this time at the age of 62. When she went, and she went on campus, instead of jeers and rocks and toilet paper being thrown at her, she was treated with cheers and jubilation, celebrating her enrollment supporters all around her, praising her for her bravery. She was honored in a frame in the English department during that time. And not four years later, in 1992, she would graduate finally with that degree in hand that she so valiantly fought for. At the end of the day, God's will prevailed. It wasn't a straight line. It wasn't an easy path to get to where justice could prevail, but it got there. And God used those circumstances, used that suffering, and those who fought for the civil rights of African Americans to overcome and be where they are today, equal. And so, likewise, we can see that through the life of Abraham through the life of our culture today, that even though we are far from perfect and won't be perfect until Christ's second coming, we can be comforted knowing that God is at work through suffering, through depression, through our doubts and our own faithlessness, God is still working in the midst of that. Because remember, just like going through those two halves of that sacrificed animal, God has committed himself and he has bound himself to an oath. And nowhere is that more illustrated than what Christ did at the cross where God gave his only son and sacrificed it when we didn't have to do anything, when we just sat by and were satisfied with our sinfulness. God made a path for not just the Israelites, not just a particular people group, but all people, all tribes and tongues can know and celebrate him without a veil, without a temple, and have full access to God's glory. And how amazing is that? So as we continue 
into our series of Exodus and we see the growth and the arc of Moses, it's not going to be easy. The Israelites are not going to have righteousness and justice immediately present in their lives. They are going to, be, they're going to suffer. Uh, they're going to get lost. Many will die along the way. But through the suffering, through the hardships, we can see God's righteousness at work. It would be so easy to say, oh, I'm saved. You know, Jesus has found in my heart and I won't have to suffer. I won't have to hurt and I won't have to pay anything. I can just accept Christ. But we know that is far from the Christian reality. It is in those times when we are suffering, when we are hurting, when God seems further away, that our faith actually means something. When we're actually paying a cost to seeing God at work. Where we're not just saying, oh, because things are great, I can praise God. But no, when things are at their hardest, when things are at their worst, despite all of that, I am trusting in God. That is true faith. And I know now for many of us, we are suffering. There's many loss. There's a lot of division within our country. There's a pandemic out there um, that will hopefully be contained soon, but nevertheless, there will still be continued loss. Regardless, we need to have faith. And now more than any time before, do we need to be looking towards Jesus, towards the cross for our salvation. If we look towards human leaders or politicians, we're going to be disappointed because they all will fall short. Only through Christ can we know and have peace. Only he is the perfect one that's going to be our foundation, that's going to cradle us, that's going to get us through these hard times that are ahead. So I tell you, as a pastor with a broken heart, that times ahead of us are not going to be easy. Things are going to get worse before they get better. As we still await the second coming of Christ. And just as Abraham waited for his promise and didn't live to see his promise, similarly, Paul, Peter, and the apostles waited for Christ's coming, not knowing it would be many years later till that comes to fruition. So Christians, we are at a waiting period. We are at a time awaiting with full faithfulness that God is going to fulfill his promises. And even though we are going to be living in a broken, sinful world that's far from heavenly perfection, we will still be awaiting just as it is, as, as if it was going to be tomorrow, that Christ is going to return triumphantly and conquer the evil in this world just like the dean of the University of Alabama was later fired and disgraced for what he did with Althrain, and, and similarly how Pharaoh seized power to enslave the Israelites, they will be conquered, they will be overcome, Pharaoh will fall, and Christ will rise victorious again. Let us pray. Father, we know times are not easy. Lord, there's so much loss. There are so many stages in life where hopelessness seems to permeate. But Father, we know, looking to humans, looking to leaders, looking to this world, we will never be satisfied, Father. But God, as we go to the well with unending water, where we will not thirst again, and having faith not in Christ and also the world, not in Christ and also my favorite leader or pastor or, le or politician, but Father, only in your Son alone can we have true peace and true faith in you, Jesus. So Father, I pray that you come. Father, for those who maybe have ran away from their faith, that have doubted, Lord, maybe they've gone to church all their life, but Lord, now is the time for them to truly see you and have a personal relationship with your son, Jesus. Father, even though it's hard, even though we doubt, even though we're not perfect and we're sinful and we're dumb and we make mistakes, God, you still love us. God, you still made a promise to us, even though we had did nothing to deserve it. 
but only through Christ is your grace can be seen, Jesus. Thank you so much. Words cannot express our gratitude for that. In your son's holy name we pray, amen.